In 1910 the colonial authorities in British Somaliland Protectorate adopted a policy of coastal concentration after their lack of success in subduing the Darvish movement. Realizing that this policy would be expose their protected tribes and put them at the mercy of the Sheik they decided to arm the civilian population of the Protectorate. This move led to an appalling internecine warfare among the tribes friendly to the British as they began settling old scores with the modern arms and ammunition that they received from the English. A British official conceded that he could could not see any good at concealing the fact that during this period, it is estimated that about one third of the male population of the friendly tribes of this protectorate was exterminated in inter-tribal fighting. We can see how the rash actions and lack of foresight of the British led to this holocaust. By the end of the 1912 the Protectorate administration took steps to change this situation by creating a mobile force mounted on camels and horses named the Camel Constabulary. It was headed by Mr. Richard Corfield, a man of considerable political and military experience in the Somali theater. From November 1912 to March 1913 the force met with great success in restoring order but at the cost of losing the confidence of some friendly tribes because of the harsh methods of collective punishment that he adopted. There is a story of a man named Ina Waysakzum, a victim of Corfield's injustice, who composed a maledictory poem wishing the death of Corfield for his unjust ways and the suffering, poverty and misery that he brought on the poet's family. Corfield's mounted constabulary became as feared as the Darwishes and order among the friendly tribes was restored. The incident that cost him his life however began with an aggression against a Darwish caravan without escorts. The caravan was sent by Khalif Sheikh Abdil from the Koraksi fort and it was bringing necessary supplies of arms, ammunition and clothing to the Darwish forts. The caravan was intercepted near Bir by a force that was sent from Burko, heavily armed, led by a man named Ahmed Ilkakase and they managed to loot the caravan. When news reached the Zarin of this terrible disaster the Said personally took charge in mobilizing a force. Every member of the QCC was ordered to open his arsenal and hand over the last bullet to retrieve the Darwish caravan and punish the people who attacked the Dara Wish. A force of 1,000 men was readied comprising of members of five Darwish divisions, Shikayale, Golwain, Targoy, Minanil and Ragson, all of them under the overall command of Yusuf Sheikh Kabdil. Ismail Meyer was commanding the elite Sheikhiale division, exclusively Dolba Hanante, Ali Jerry, Barasame, Kayad and Hassan Ugas. The Dara Awish recovered much of the goods that were in the caravan and they also looted a very large stock from the various settlements TP whom the caravan raiders belonged. On 6, August 1913 the British received alarming reports of heavy Darwish activity between Idawin and Burko, their operations extending to within three or four miles of beer. Deputy Commissioner of Somaliland Protectorate Geoffrey Archer was in Burko, coincidentally, at the time and was surprised by the extraordinary Darwish attack. He may have suspected, even though he did not write so, that he was the primary object of the Darwish attack. Upon that very morning I had been listening in Durbar for four hours to the representations of the friendlies, representations to the effect that, unless government would come to their assistance and protect them with an adequate force, their annihilation at the hands of the Darvishes would be complete within a year or two. I admit therefore, that at first I was skeptical as to the imminence of danger represented as pressing at 1.30 p.m. of the same day. The Dervishes had not attacked the locality in force for two years and that they should have selected this very time, when I happened to be present, to arrive on the scene, from the Haroon, Zarin, 170 miles distant as the crow flies, and I need scarcely say that we can get no reliable information, of course, of dervish intentions in advance, appeared to me to be too extraordinary a coincidence to be credited. However, after a discussion on the situation with Mr. Corfield, I adopted the view that some action was obviously indicated, even though I still regarded the information as likely to be without foundation in fact, and supplied by their friendlies merely to impress me with the extreme seriousness of their plight. I, accordingly, ordered a strong reconnaissance by the Camel Corps in the direction of Beer to ascertain the facts, and instructed Captain G. H. Summers, Indian contingent, 
to accompany the force with a view to forming his own conclusions and advising me later on the military situation before I decided on future action. Despite his skepticism when discounting the reports of Darwish activity, Deputy Commissioner Archer did not take chances with his life and immediately retired to Sheik, seeking safety and distance. The Darwishes after the death of Corfield were singing songs that included lines alluding to the cowardice of Archer after he fled from the theater. The Camel Constabulary set out of Burko at 3 p.m. on 8 August led by Corfield, assisted by Captain Dunn and Captain G. H. Summers with 116 soldiers. Corfield had intelligence that the Darwish forces were bivouacked at Ulusan 30 miles southeast of Burko and proceeded in that direction. On their approach the Camel Constabulary could hear some shots fired and the Dervish fires illuminating the night sky. Friendlies who reconnoitered the Darwish forces estimated its strength at 2,000 riflemen, with 150 horse. The numbers may be unreliable. Now let us take a look at some passages from the Ismail Myers poem on the death of Corfield. He die was cast and an engagement between the British and the Darwish Mujahids became inevitable. The British High Command did not wish to engage the Darwishes but Corfield was a rash man and disregarded his orders. Archer later wrote that Corfield disregarded express orders not to engage the enemy. My standing orders communicated to you as an enclosure to my secret dispatch of the 23rd of June, and duly approved by your dispatch of the 18th of July, gave, as you are aware, no discretionary powers whatsoever, in the matter of engaging the dervishes, or even proceeding on these extended patrols. It was fated that the two forces would meet and on 9th of August at 5.30 a.m. Corfield and his men left Darkane, and proceeded to Magalaya to cut off the Darwishes. At 6.45 a.m. the Darwishes, having earlier spotted the British movements, severely attacked the constabulary and the attack continued for the next five hours. Archer wrote. At 7.15 a.m. Mr. Corfield, fighting gallantly was shot through the head and died instantly. The bodies of his interpreter Haji Jama Yella, a well-known and loyal servant of this protectorate, and his two personal servants were found during the action lying close beside him. The Darwish forces, realizing the automatic fire of the British Maxim gun posed the greatest danger to themselves, made the gun's destruction a priority. As a result the Maxim gun was put out of action by the Dara a wish from the outset. It was later reported that the Maxim position drew heavy Darwish fire and was put out of action by Darwish shooting after firing little more than three belts. Of the five-man team serving the gun, one man was killed and three were wounded. Having achieved that initial objective the Darwishes wanted to capture it and began moving in on the position. On one occasion hand-to-hand -hand fighting ensued and a Darwish was shot by Captain Summers, actually within the British stronghold. The Darwishes were intent on annihilating the small force and capturing their heavy guns but the British force fought tenaciously in their strongholds and around midday the Darwish force ran out of ammunition and decided to retire with their looted stock before finishing their adversaries. At 3.30 p.m., Mr. Dunn, the only Englishman who was unscathed, started organizing the British retreat back to their garrison in Burko, after ascertaining that the dervishes had drawn off. Darwish Ismail Meyer had this to say about the episode. He British casualties were 33 killed and 17 wounded. The official inquiry into the Dulmadubi fiasco placed Darwish casualties at 200. Prevost Battersby claims 375. No one can be certain about Darwish casualties but those inflated numbers were surely fabricated by the officers who blundered by taking the small force into action. The Dara Awish celebrated Ruga, as they named the battle, as a massive victory that destroyed the meddling camel constabulary and avenged the men who were killed when the Darwish caravan was looted. Deputy Commissioner Archer lamented the fact that many of the tribes on the frontier were not more engaged in the anti-Darwish efforts of the British by fighting proactively against them. The Darwish attack on the friendly tribes that precipitated the engagement had reduced the hardline anti-Darwish tribes at the sharp end of the frontier to destitution after the looting of a stock conservatively estimated at 6,000 camels, 20,000 to 30,000 sheep. The looted tribes were about 300 members of those tribes rode along with Corfield and the Camel Constabulary in a bid to recover their looted stock but they melted away at the start of the fight. 
The Dara Awish consolidated this victory by expanding their influence into Togdir by building three forts at the Shimbibiris wells that are strategically located and protected by commanding heights on all sides. That left a strong Darwish force only 28 miles from the largest British garrison in the area, Burko. Shimbibiris was supplied from the coast, 160 miles north. This proved unacceptable to the British and a year later, 17, November 1914, the British mounted an expedition to destroy Shimbibiris. The Dara Awish received intelligence of the impending attack and sent their herds eastwards and prepared for battle. After an 11-hour battle the British withdrew after failing to dent the impregnable defences of the forts. A new plan was developed by the British calling for the destruction of the fort using explosive charges at the base of the forts instead of bombardment. In February, 1915 the British finally succeeded in dislodging the Darwish forces from Shimbiburis using the the explosives. All the Darwishes inside perished fighting valiantly to the last man. They punctuated every volley from their rifles with the chant, Galo Qudhunli, Qiiq Ma Ka Kare. The destruction of the fort and the death of the glorious Darwish Mujahids who perished in its defense was a shocking development that filled the Dara Awish movement with anguish and sorrow. They turned their grief into action and they immediately started organizing a small elite force to attack Berbera in order to strike a blow against British rule of Somalia by attacking the very heart of their authority. At all events to strike chaos and fear into the British and the inhabitants of Berbera with the message that they could not feel safe anywhere. Forty cavalrymen were selected for this mission headed by Darwish Haji Mursal A Saeed with Ismail Mir as the second in command of the assault. In early March, 1915, the group of 40 Darwishes set off for Berbera guided by Mujahid Sirar Shah who had specialized knowledge of the terrain and on 8 March they reached Chilon Beetle where they set up a bivouac, getting some rest and watering their horses. They left the plains behind safely without being spotted and reached the cover of the mountains. It was here that they found their passage blocked by a British garrison that was guarding the mountain passes. This development caused great trepidation among the Darwishes and some of them even counseled that the mission should be aborted. Ismashil Meyer was dismayed by this, and he managed to change their minds by stiffening their resolve and reminding them of the rightness of their ultimate cause, and their obligation to endure its pangs and toils. He also suggested a practical way, short of frontal assault, to solve their dilemma. It was agreed that they should use the cover of night travel to elude the English sentries and in this they were successful. He composed the following poem for the occasion. O Wikes, an indolent man receives neither blessing and nor increase the men who are on the road who have filled us with dread and who have unsettled our spirit as if they were conquering lions I will swear by Allah that women are more formidable than they I shall set Bud, his horse, on the warpath. Towards glory it was bred to kill the children of filth at daybreak will their corpses litter Berbera whatever portion Allah has decreed for us I shall tighten the girth strap on my stallion. On the afternoon of 13 March 1915 the forty Darwish horsemen furiously rode into town. Shooting in all directions and destroying property. One of the casualties that day was a citizen of Berbera who used to boast that the Darwishes will only discomfit those people who choose to herd camels in the interior of the country. He composed a comical poem to emphasize that point which ran this way. This hapless man was one of the people who died that day at Berbera. This assault caused consternation among the British authorities and it necessitated the withdrawal of all non-essential personnel from Berber A. We will take up our story next time at the denouement of the Darwish struggle and continue on to the story of the murder of Jama Ali Noor. In the middle of year 1918 Syed Muhammad moved the Darwish headquarters, from Talix to Sanag. It was felt necessary that the Darwish should have bases close to the Mecca coast in order to facilitate their access to the sea for trade and rearmament purposes. As well, the Darwishes were under immense pressure with constant raiding, ambushes and looting from the Gudkas Majertin, ruled by Bokor Sisman, their king based in Bosaso. Bokor Isman was heavily armed by the Italians and was under instructions from them to make life difficult for the Darawish in Nugal region. Syed Muhammad gathered his senior Kujusi councillors and many alternatives were broached. Some advised a move towards the riverine areas of the south and join the Darwish forces already based there Hiran and Kalkaluk. Others counselled a retreat to Illig and Ale on the Indian Ocean, 
formerly the Darwish headquarters. But the Saeed Plum for Sanag citing the above-mentioned reasons and it would turn out to be a fateful decision. The Darawish already had four forts in the region Jidali, Sarad, Baden and Galbarabir, and the initial plan was to use Jidali as the Darwish headquarters. Jidali was a well-built fort that served the Darawish very well over the years. The Darwishmen used to sing. Be that as it may, it was decided that Jidali lay exposed in in the plains and a new fort was commissioned to be built in Midhishi, next to streams nestled inside two mountains. The Darawish came to Sanag with vast ambitions after the movement hit the doldrums ever since the destruction of the Shimbibiris fort. The destruction of that fort, despite the heroic resistance of its defenders, was a great blow to the morale of the Darwish. Colonel later General Lord, Ismay who was part of the British force that destroyed the fort was mightily impressed with the quality of the Darwish fighters who defended the fort. In his memoirs published in 1960, he wrote, All our efforts to dig out the defenders were in vain. I was sorry they had fought well. Sarnag was intended to renew the movement and great initiatives were proposed to bring that about. The Darwish fort at Galbarabir was intended to be the link to Arabia and preparations were made to cut large amount of timber to construct dows to carry Darwish trade from Maid and Hayes. However there were also many conspiracies afoot, and there were fissures within the movement. There was barely concealed hatred and loathing between the leading members of the Darwish leadership on each side of the Saeed's lineage maternal and paternal. It is narrated that Ugal C. Megan proposed the following three points to the Saeed. He later used to boast that his proposal was a deliberate plan to undermine the Darwish movement, and lead to its destruction. 1. Cutting off all contacts and travel between Berbera, and all Darwish bases. 2. The discontinuation of all farming that was carried out by Darwish. 3. Raising doubts about the loyalty of Amir Sheikh Hassan, Kagul, the Saeed's uncle. Ugal Seed argued that Amir had designs on Darwish leadership at the expense of the Saeed. His advice was followed and all Darwish contacts with the English held areas ceased. Kamir Kagul was marginalized and his wise and fearless counsel was lost to the Darwish. Both had a large impact on the outcome of the final Darwish-English confrontation because the lack of Darwish intelligence on British intentions and war plans exacerbated the psychological damage inflicted by the appearance of the British Air Force over Darwish areas. 21st of January, 1920 saw the attack on Galbarabir and Midishi fought by the British from the air and the ground. Douglas Jardine writing in his book was full of admiration for the defenders of Galbarabir describing them as the bravest of the brave and the English did not capture the fort until the last defender expired in service to his country and faith. Midhishi was under constant bombardment for three days and it is said that thirty people died there including the discredited Kamir Kagul, the Saeed's uncle and Mujahid Afkash, Arden Aliyai. The appearance of the British airplanes created chaos and confusion far exceeding the actual military damage effected by the bombs they were dropping. Darwish leadership came to the conclusion to withdraw eastwards back to the Talix fort which was by far the biggest of all Darwish strongholds. Many of the leading Talbahant personalities counseled that they should separate from the movement and in order to save the tribe, under pressure from British reprisals, and its livestock that they should head for the deep horde. Thousands of Talbahant perished in the aftermath of the British operations with thousands more children who were often dying of neglect or being kidnapped by the enemy. A group of Talbahant leaders headed by Ismail Meyer and which included Hirsi Jidlaid, Hirsi Arton Booz, Dukale Ali I left Midhishi on 24 January headed towards the horde. Unfortunately they ran into a British force led by Colonel Ismay who detained them. When the British recognized that they had captured the legendary Darwish Mujahid Ismail L he was immediately transferred in custody to Berbera suffering great ill treatment for such a distinguished prisoner. He was brought before a British magistrate to state his case but he kept looking at the floor silently even when spoken to. The Isaac interpreters told the Darwish to look up and regard the British magistrate fully in the face. Darwish Ismail said. 
The face that beheld the Sayyid shall not look upon an infidel. The Isaac interpreters were greatly panicked by this show of defiance and, trembling with fear, told him to speak up and address the magistrate as Sahib, a degrading, deferential form of address used by the Somalis who worked with the colonialists, to address the British. The Somalis have a saying Hadid dimineso darka wa leska da and the English believe in defeat, defiance. So the Englishman was aware of Darwish Ismail intent when the Darwish said, the tongue that uttered Sayyidi I will not say Sahib. When they asked him to clarify whether other prisoners were affiliated with the dervishes or not Darwish Ismail replied, a stray Darwish will not be denounced by me. Although he was sentenced to death in abstention in 1915 for his role in the raid on Berbera, Darwish Ismail was released after 18 months when the Darwish movement was conclusively destroyed. The British had no intention of martyring him. Upon his release Ismail Maya retired to the Dhulbahant country where he dispensed his wisdom and the history of the Darwish struggle. He recalled in one poignant poem, addressed to his friend and relative Jama Ali Noor, the bitterness that accompanied his arrest at Badwain, bereft of the Dhulbahant who sought refuge in the deep horde from the vengeful British. When flying airplanes were roaring over my head, reaching Badwain on the back of an emaciated colt, when old women and fools were exultant at my plight, when the people of Cain were unrecognizable to me, a thousand in battle dress were craving my blood. A few short years after the defeat of the Darwish, Ismail Maya was traveling with his confidant and great friend Haji Muhammad all when they came upon a solitary settlement. An old lady recognized Ismail and lamented that all her children were killed by Ismail and his Darwish and all her livestock looted by them. Mindful and aware of the destruction that was wrought upon the land by the holy anti-colonial struggle, and unwilling to shoulder the entire blame for the horrors that took place, a pained Ismail Maya composed the following poem that night. At the Battle of Jidbael, and the disaster that was Zargaga, the horrors of Ruaga, and the satiated vultures, Viriga, were blame and denunciations were rife. The corpses that littered the fields hitherto grazed by camels, everywhere bones protruding from decaying bodies. The proud Ogden who lost all their livestock. The Edor, numberless camels lost in half a day. The whole of Shurzor reduced to poverty. Gutkas and Majertine, forbidden to own camels. The face of every nobleman, darkened by impotent rage all creatures, scattered to the four winds by conflict. He begs the old lady, for the sake of her eternal soul, not to put this heavy, and intolerable burden on his shoulders alone. In the early thirties, the British commissioned a group to gather intelligence on the surviving Darwish generals. They found and compiled reports on the activities of many Darwish elders such as Ismail Maya, Sira Shaw, Hirsi Arton Booz, Al Tulbahant, or Yusuf Deer, Ogden, Bar Jerry, and Norhashi, War Sanjali. All of them were leading peaceful lives as village or town elders and British took no further interest in their activities. But circumstances forced Ismail Maya prominently back into the picture when three years later his old friend and beloved cousin Jamma Kali Noor was cold-bloodedly murdered at Zargaga by a force of British Ilayalos. Ismail Maya mounted